Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort, and we are here for a video that's going to take place in two separate playlists. Uh, number one, obviously, the short story discussion playlist, uh, growing ever larger. But number two, the read-along series for the Dubliners. This is the 12th in a 15-part series going short story by short story through Dubliners by James Joyce, the, the infamous perhaps, collection of short stories. And today's story is known as Ivy Day in the Committee Room. We will start with a So What Happened portion where we just recap the story. Then we will get into a literary criticism portion of the video, four notes in that. And then I have but one note in the Writer's Corner section of this video for uh, Ivy Day in the Committee Room by James Joyce. So... What happened? Ivy Day is in memory of Charles Stuart Parnell. We are celebrating Ivy Day with the individuals in this short story. And we find our characters, National Party guys, waiting on their pay as they have been out campaigning for Richard Tierney for mayor. Richard owns one of the local pubs. They have uh, all sorts of visitors during their time in this room, gallivanting around with each other, just sort of uh, talking about different things. They have uh, visitors from clergy to political opponents to possibly spies. There is a spy that seems to be going to the opposite party with all of their information and possibly even going to the British with the things that they've learned in these meetings. A man named Mr. Hinchy seems to be leading most of the discussions. He's perturbed about the, tar the tardiness of their pay, but he believes that Tierney will in fact be good for the money. Uh, he he has someone bring drinks for them, after all, and they drink. An argument ensues as O'Connor suggests the supremacy, as Parnell would have agreed, of political theory over tangible results. Mr. Hinchy replies with, Parnell is dead. Then, after a little bit of um, cooling in the room on Mr. Hinchy, uh, support for O'Connor breaks out. O'Connor, is that an Irish last name? I don't know. Then everyone calls for O'Connor to read th that poem, that poem he wrote. Well, I guess he doesn't read it. He recites it from memory. But what are we doing here? There is, in for the literary criticism... There is an interesting little bit here at the beginning of this short story. Quote, Mr. O'Connor put his cigarette into his mouth and began to search his pockets. He took out a pack of thin pasteboard cards. I'll get you a match, said the old man. Never mind, this'll do, said Mr. O'Connor. He selected one of the cards and read what was printed on it. Municipal Elections, Royal Exchange Ward. Mr. Richard J. Tierney, PLG, respectfully solicits the favor of your vote and influence at the coming election in the Royal Exchange Ward. Mr. O'Connor had been engaged by Tierney, Tierney's agent, to canvas one part of the ward, but as the weather was inclement and his boots let in the wet, he spent a great part of the day sitting by the fire in the committee room in a wicker in Wicker Street with Jack, the old caretaker. They had been sitting, thus the short day had grown dark. It was the 6th of October, dismal and cold out of doors. Mr. O'Connor tore a strip of the card and, lighting it, lit his cigarette. What does that tell you? Well, that tells you to this, that to this group of people, yes, there is some bit of idealism involved. They are here, uh, after all, after stumping for Mr. Tierney. Well, most of them. Maybe not Mr. O'Connor. He was inside most of the day. But 
Mr. O'Connor is the one who later in the story brings up the idea that we should be in this for the principle. That we, we are here for political uh, political theory over tangible results. Then he sets the card on fire in order to light his cigarette because it is all about the vices over the politics. And we get this later in the story too, don't we? We get this later in the story too with the drink taking reign over everyone involved. Everyone's there maybe to get paid, but by God, they celebrate that bottle when it comes in, don't they? These are a, this is a group of individuals who celebrate the vice over the politics. And that is perhaps part of the struggle. We have this sort of, once the, once the bottles come in, this almost acquiescence to their presence, right? As if every, everyone was sitting around waiting ostensibly on their pay. Ostensibly. But when the boy shows up with the bottles, they offer the boy a bottle, but they don't really want to give him one. This leads me to the second thing that I want to talk about here. So I, I think that is a, a great big point in this short story. The fault of the individual is what is hampering their idealistic movement. And we're going to possibly come back to a little bit of this with the uh, writer's corner note there. But we get this on page 90. Well, my page 90 in, in, in this collection. Some of these hillsiders and Finians are a bit too clever, if you ask me, said Mr. Hinchy. Do you know what my private and candid opinion is about some of these little jokers? I believe half of them are in the pay of the castle. This is... This makes me wonder... This idea that some of these, uh, what is it here? They are a bit too clever, if you ask me. You know, I'm not someone who believes that I am particularly intelligent. I'm probably an average intelligent kind of guy. I do not worry about the people in the government being too clever. That's not my big worry. My big worry is that the people in the White House right now, that the people in the White House possibly for the entire time I've been alive, are kind of morons who have convinced themselves that they're oh so smart, while in reality, I've met some really smart people. They go into business for themselves. That's what all the smartest people that I've known do. They go into business for themselves, create a world in which they are the center of the sphere, the center mass, and then they run their own life. It's the dum-dums who've convinced themselves, we really are the intelligent ones, we should be running the government. But they're dum-dums that just kind of want an influential job because they've convinced themselves that they are the smart ones. Where is the line? Why is it? Is, is this a uniquely American hubris that I have, that I'm worried about the government being full of idiots versus the government being full of people who are too clever? Is this too clever, as cited by Mr. Hinchy? actually sarcasm is the cleverness cited by mr hinchy sort of lost in translation between irish culture at the turn of the last century and american culture today is that what 
he would mean to say is they're too clever being what I believe is the government being full of people who've convinced themselves that they're smart. Is that what clever means to him? At what point should be, should we, at what point do people stop being worried that individuals in charge are too intelligent and become worried that the individuals in charge are actually morons? At what point does that happen? Does that flip? On what is that flip contingent? Why? And I don't know. I don't know anyone. Yeah, I don't know anyone. So the only paranoia that I really know about uh, towards the intellectuals, towards actual smart people, are is the distrust towards the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. Distrust towards the Elon Musks of the world. But is this a, is this a mechanism of the American experience being that if you are one of these really intelligent people, you know that you have the freedom to create a world in which you are the center mass. And if you can do that, why wouldn't you? Right? Was So, like, um, one of the points that Jimmy Carr made recently, British comedian, was on Joe Rogan. And he said, um, part of the problem with the Catholic Church is that for a really long time, the Catholic Church was full of all of the smartest guys you ever met. So there were all of these positions within the Catholic Church. And then the plague happened, and the Catholic Church was gutted. But those positions still had to be filled, so they were taking lesser and lesser quality people. In Ireland of this day, were all of the really intelligent people filtering into politics? That would be something, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be something? Imagine having someone in the White House that you thought, man, that guy sure is better than me. Smarter, harder working, more honest. Golly, that guy... That guy's the guy. You know, we don't get that. We don't get that here. Um, so, speaking of intelligence. Intelligence. Um, speaking of learning. Okay. Speaking of institutions. Institutions passing down knowledge. Institutions passing down tradition. We have here mention of the clergy. We have here uh, these ideas about an emerging country. Ireland. The new Ireland. The national party. We have, in this short story, ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny. Maybe. We have a small institution. In this room, we have a group of guys. Right? And they, they venture to argue about some things. They venture to have debate they venture to declare that they are working towards the better of the nation. All of those things happen in this short story. They're discussed, I mean. But the only learning that goes on in this short story, 
The only time anyone learns anything, the only time anyone teaches anything, is when Mr. Hinchy teaches the trick that he has to open the bottles without a corkscrew. That's the only time anybody learns anything. The only time anyone learns anything is when Mr. Hinchy is teaching how to get to the vice. Because we're here for the vice above the politics. The vice above the idealism. And what do these vices do, by the way? The vices... Now, cigarettes, tobacco, is a stimulant. But how often do people say, I need to smoke to pep myself up? Normally, it's to calm yourself down. Normally, it's to kind of mellow out. That's why, that's why people use it. I, I can't... I don't smoke cigarettes. I've smoked cigars. I chew some tobacco. But the idea of cigarette, I don't know. But... I've never heard anyone say, let me hit this cigarette before I go run this mile. It's not a peppy thing. Liquor, the bottle, doesn't pep you up. So these things, these vices, are also depressants. Well, mellowers out. No one is hyping themselves up in this room. There's no tea or coffee going around. Um, is there coffee? I can't remember now, but it seems there might have been a mention of coffee. Anyway, uh, it is just interesting that um, the only time anyone learns anything is how to get towards the vice. The last thing I want to talk about in this portion of the video. There's mention of a spy. Someone's going to the opposition with everything that gets discussed in this room. Someone is going to possibly the Brits with everything that gets discussed in this room. Who is it? Is it the fellow that gets accused of being the spy? Is it O'Connor? Is it Hinchy? Why would it, how can you say it would be Hinchy? Well, methinks the lady doth protest too much. Hinchy is sure to point out, you know, they're spies. I think it's that guy. It's someone. Certainly it is not me. That guy could have been a spy. You don't know he wasn't. I think. Why do I think? Just because I think someone's a spy. Must be him. What about O'Connor? O'Connor who wrote the stellar poem about Parnell's passing. Is this another example of protesting too much? Well, maybe. Because we do have this. Remember, from the beginning of the short story, Mr. O'Connor put his cigarette in his mouth and began to search his pockets. He took out a pack of thin pasteboard cards. I'll get you a match, said the old man. Never mind, this'll do. This'll do. What was it he set on fire? Municipal elections. Royal Exchange Ward. Mr. Richard J. Tierney. It was his business card from the guy he's representing. Oh, okay, well, you know, is that circumstantial evidence? Like, why would we then go ahead and blame him? He also didn't campaign that day, did he? Everybody else was out there campaigning. But, you know, O'Connor's got bad shoes and... It's kind of wet, and when it's wet, his shoes, it, the water gets in, you know. Uh, it's, not, it's not a great thing. So I'm just going to sit by the fire for a little bit. It's inclement out there, okay? It's bad out there. What, everybody else is out there campaigning? Well, I got the bad shoes, you know. I'll still take the pay. I'll still drink the liquor. And I'm going to use your business cards to light my cigarette. Maybe O'Connor is the old spy. I think it would be... Oh, who... who? If there's a gun in scene one, it has to go off by the fourth act, the third act, whatever. What There's something like that. Everybody knows the quote. Everybody knows the quote. If there's a spy mentioned in the first couple pages, surely we have seen the spy. 
by the end of the short story. I contend that it's either Mr. Henchy or Mr. O'Connor. Even the name O'Connor seems a bit suspicious to me, almost too Irish. Now, Writer's Corner. I, I have over 1,300 videos on the internet talking about literature. I, in these times, these contentious times, these terrible times, these times where everyone is oh so serious and dour, these times where everyone's cause is just the biggest cause in the world, Every, these times where everyone is able to point and laugh, but by God, when they get pointed at and laughed at, it's you who's wrong. These terrible political times. I, who have 1,300 plus videos on the internet talking, of, and this isn't going to be a personal thing, I promise. 1,300 plus videos on the internet talking about literature. A great percentage of those videos, I say, literature is not political. I say that if it is, then it's just propaganda. That's not art. Art and propaganda are sharply dichotomized. They are divorced. The two cannot be one. How can I say this? Art is contingent, the idea of art is contingent upon the reader, the viewer, the listener, having the decision to make for themselves. If the creator of the song, the movie, the story, the poem, if that writer has in mind what you, the consumer, are to take from his or her piece, then it is propaganda. Now, as the consumer... I can always accept it as art. Why? Because I can present it, I can accept it, as presented with irony. I can accept it as presented with irony. I can say, I can read, I can watch a political ad from Nancy Pelosi, whoever it is. And I can say, I can choose to interpret, oh, well, this person is a liar. Therefore, this becomes art. Because I am not willing to accept that whatever this person, in this example, Nancy Pelosi, just a politician off the top of my head, this person presented this ad and is lying in it. So, the interpretation is still mine. I get to say at what point she lied. I get to say about what things she lied. I get to say, you know, the emphasis on X, Y, or Z because A, B, and C, one, two, or three. We can accept even propaganda as art. We can accept art as propaganda. But another thing that has gotten me in great deals of trouble, and I'm not, I'm not presenting this as it shouldn't have. I'm presenting this as, isn't this funny? I have 20 plus videos on James Joyce in which I say, James Joyce is an artist, not a politician. James Joyce is not writing about politics. How can you say James Joyce is not writing about politics when the portrait of the artist as a young man is almost exclusively about politics? I've, Ivy Day in the committee room almost exclusively about politics. Saying James Joyce is not political really triggers people. But here, you read the story. What are James Joyce's politics? 
Tell me, what are James Joyce's politics? This story is very much about Irish nationalism, isn't it? Isn't it? It's called Ivy Day in the committee room. How political can you get? What does James Joyce think about these things? It seems to me that what James Joyce has done, James Joyce has presented individuals doing what these individuals do. James Joyce is accurately presenting this time and these people. Here they are in the committee room. Hinchy is extremely paranoid about a spy at the beginning of this story, isn't he? But by the end of the story, by the end of the story, this nationalist, this Irish nationalist is saying, if it's good for the country, it's good for the country. I'll accept the king on board. The king being the British king. I'll accept him on board. I don't care if it's good for the country. It's good for the country. So what does James Joyce think? Was James Joyce a nationalist, a separatist? Was James Joyce a Catholic? James Joyce, it seems, was a nationalist. But he was a nationalist in a way that he thought for himself. He was a nationalist that didn't really agree with the way that he thought Ireland was emerging. Was James Joyce a Catholic? Seems he was. It seems he, he, he had a contentious relationship with religion, you know, James Joyce wrote about some pretty wretched people in the clergy. James Joyce presents every member of the clergy in this short story as very well respected. The real, the real answer to the question, what were James Joyce's politics the real answer to that question is this, who cares? James Joyce slapped these dollops of short stories on our plate as the reader for us to chew on and gain the nutrients regardless of what it was that James Joyce thought. James Joyce, as I said, seems to have been a nationalist. These are National Party guys. Who's the best one among them? Are these fellas presented as the gold standard of individual? Oh, well, I guess I shouldn't use that accent. <laughs> well, look at me, going out, stomping, stomping for me candidate. Right? Look at me. Oh, I'm just the greatest fella. Is that what we have in this short story? Or are all of these people in their own worlds and in their own ways corrupt? In their own worlds and in their own ways, stand-up guys. It seems very much to me that what we have here are full people, 3D individuals. Part of what I fear is literature dying on many levels. Is the neglect of that care. James Joyce took great care to present real, live people with good sides and shadows all over his literature. In his literature, Ernest Hemingway called James Joyce the greatest writer in the world. Hemingway said that. Hemingway doesn't want to say that about any way, anyone but Hemingway. But he did. James Joyce presented real people. 
because the people are a thousand times more compelling than the politics. That's all I have.